justice, peace building, and conflict transformation in 2019. And can I just say that title makes me want to go back to school. Uh, but I won't, so it's all right. Uh, while she was at Emory, Hannah worked with uh, Emory University's Office of Sustainability Initiatives, coordinating a sustainability program in the residence halls to promote sustainable living and equip students to advocate for environmental initiatives on campus. As the program coordinator, Hannah brings uh, programs and workshops to communities of faith across Georgia to inspire faith-based responses to environmental concerns. And we're delighted to have you with us this morning and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Is it okay if I take my mask off? Is that okay with everyone? Okay, if you can hear me better that way. Um, hey everyone, it's so good to see you this morning. Thanks for inviting me. It's fun to be here. Um, as you just heard, I graduated from Candler School of Theology on Emory's campus. It's always fun um, to come back to the campus and come back to Glenn. I attended here occasionally while I was at school and did some events here and things. So it's really fun to be back. So good to see you all this morning. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about creation care and tell you a little bit about our organization, Georgia Interfaith Power and Light, um, and talk to you a little bit about ways that uh, your faith community can get involved with um, environmental justice work. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what environmental justice is and some advocacy items, and then I have an um, advocacy action that I would love us to, love all of us to participate in this morning. Um, but first, just a little bit about um, who is Gipple. So we were founded in 2003, and our mission is to work with communities of faith across the state um, to care, help uh, faith communities care for creation through worship, education, and stewardship. Um, and since 2003, we've partnered with over 500 congregations across the state. So that's doing things like um, energy audits, um, solar initiatives, advocacy initiatives, um, and our green team work, which you'll hear a little bit more about in a bit. We are part of a national network called Interfaith Power and Light. Um, so they were founded in 2000 and are active in almost, four, I think it's a little over 40 states now across the country. So almost every state has a chapter or an associate of Interfaith Power and Light, but we're all kind of our own 501c3, um, nonprofits and um, are all independently funded, but it's great to be part of this kind of national network. When Interfaith Power and Light started in 2000, they um, started with the goal of mobilizing a national religious response to climate change, and they were focused specifically on the energy efficiency piece of the work. Since then, they've really kind of broadened their scope and are focused more uh, broadly on environmental issues, particularly environmental justice and advocacy. Um, so what is creation care and why do we care about this as people of faith? Um, I'd like to say that creation care is um, a faithful response to the climate crisis. It's recognizing that the world is created, sustained, and loved by God, and that God calls us to care for God's creation. Um, one of the scriptures that I always look to when I talk about this is Genesis 2.15. This is actually the second creation account. It's when God um, creates man from the dust and dirt of the earth and places the first human in the garden of Eden and tells him to farm it, to take care of it. Um, and in the CEV translation of this text, it specifically uses the word farm. Um, and this, the Hebrew um, word for this is used elsewhere in scripture to mean serve or service. And so I think you can think about our call to care for creation as an act of service to the earth. Um, and so I really like thinking about creation care in that way. Just as we are called to serve one another, we are also called to, to serve the earth that we, um, that we have been blessed with. And so we see all throughout scripture um, how God is calling us to care for the earth in the same way that God cares for it. So we um, see in the Psalms um, some beautiful imagery of how um, all of creation is worshiping God, how God is sustaining and um, loving and blessing creation, and how God is calling us to do the same thing. Um, and we know um, later in scripture in the New Testament how we are called to love God and love neighbor. And one of the best ways to love neighbor is by loving the earth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the justice piece of our work. But we know that what's happening to the earth is not just affecting the planet itself, but it's also affecting communities and people. And so if we are called to 
love one another and to seek justice for each other, one of the ways to do that is by actually protecting the planet and the communities who are most impacted by the climate crisis. And so creation care then is also a confession of the ways that we use and abuse the world's resources. We know that we have not always been the best stewards of the gifts um, that have been given to us. And so we need to find ways to be better stewards of those resources um, to sustain our planet for generations to come. We have a number of faith principles at Gipple. So we are an interfaith organization. So we work with all faith traditions and we have identified these four faith principles as principles that um, are shared across faith traditions that relate to how we um, can understand our call to take care of God's creation. So the first is stewardship. So again, um, asking ourselves if we are using our resources wisely, thinking about um, the responsible use of God's creation, the gifts that have been given to us. The second is justice, so working to ensure fair usage and distribution of natural resources. The third, community of life, so understanding our role in the interdependent ecosystem. We rely on the planet, and so we know that we need to take care of these resources or we won't have the water that we need to be able to drink. We won't have clean air to breathe. So just as, um, you know, the, the ecosystem around us, the animals are relying on us to um, create and maintain a good ecosystem for them. We know that we also need this for us. We need food to eat and water to drink. And then the last one is all, which is my favorite faith principle, recognizing the fingerprints of the divine in the created works. I think so often we're kind of running between um, our homes and our offices and our cars and um, kind of just going from building to building and not really recognizing the taking time to appreciate the natural world around us. And this is um, kind of what got me into this work is realizing that if we lose the nature around us, we're losing one of our best spiritual connections to God. And so taking time when we go outside um, to see God's fingerprints in all of creation, taking time to appreciate the trees and the forests and everything that we have around us and taking that time as a, a time to spiritually connect to the divine. And so I think that's um, one of the ways that we can be inspired to do this work is by taking that time to find that spiritual connection in nature and realizing that this is something that we need to maintain if we want to maintain that way of connecting with God. Um, so there are a number of ways that faith communities can um, get involved in this work. So faith communities can help members develop the spiritual connection with nature, can help um, them understand climate justice as a spiritual and ethical concern that faith communities must address. Faith communities can preach and teach on creation care. They can work to reduce the carbon footprint in the design of, of their facilities model practices for the community. I think that's an especially important role that faith communities play and advocating for policies that protect the natural world and vulnerable communities. We're going to talk a little bit about each of these um, more as we go today. Um, so I'm going to go through some of um, our programs and offerings at Gipple um, and then talk a little bit more about um, what all you can do and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So the kind of core of our work is our green team work. And we say green team is a group of three or more individuals in a congregation who are dedicated to the work of environmental stewardship. Um, and green teams are really important to our work. Green teams are grassroots organizers. They're the folks in the congregation that are identifying projects to work on, um, helping to push out advocacy initiatives, um, kind of you know getting involved locally and at the state level in policy. Um, and then you know, pushing their congregation forward in terms of reducing their carbon footprint on site, asking their faith leader to get involved in this work and to preach and teach on this um, topic. So I know you all at Glenn have had a green team and um, kind of going through a period of transition right now. Um, maybe you know, during time for Q&A at the end and discussion, we could talk a little bit more about that. And Jean, I don't know if you wanna share some more background on what all you have done um, here at the green team, but um, we're a resource for your green team. You know, we're here to help support your green team and figure out what all you want to work on um, as a faith community and how we can also connect you to other faith communities in this area who are doing this work. Um, I don't think I need to go.
go through this since you already have a, a green team, but it is, you know, you're in a time of transition. So I think you know, one of the things that you all can do is recruit new members to your green team. So if you, if any of you here today are interested in being part of a green team or um, want to learn more about what that looks like, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, I think, you know, identifying a couple of goals as a congregation, whether or not you have a green team that meets every month or you meet occasionally, or you just kind of want to work on project by project, but we're here to help you and help you identify some goals that you have as a congregation. And um, I want to hear what you all are passionate about, what you're excited about and what you think you could accomplish as a faith community. Um, we do have a green team coaching program. This is a free program. So um, it's a 12 month program. So I would work with your congregation as a green team coach, um, meeting with you every month, um, meeting with the green team leader once a month as well. It's kind of a way to provide some extra support and structure to green teams that are either um, new or relaunching or in transition, just to provide that extra support so that you're not alone in this work so that we can help you identify those goals and objectives, help you figure out how to make that happen. So if you're interested in green team coaching, I would love to serve as your green team coach um, and work with your green team one-on-one. Um, -on -one. We also have a number of educational classes or workshops. So I think this is a great way to engage the broader faith communities to offer classes on a variety um, of topics. We, have, we work with professors and scientists and practitioners across the state and offer classes on a variety of topics. We work with some professors at um, Candler and at Columbia Theological Seminary who teach um, whole classes or they can even do like a three or four week Sunday school class, um, kind of diving into scripture and really going into what does um, scripture tell us about caring for God's creation. We have classes that are more technical that are on specific environmental issues. Um, we have classes that are specifically focused on advocacy. I know you all have offered classes around classics and reducing waste before. So we have a number of classes that are um, available for you. We can also create any class that you're interested in. So if there's a topic that you're really interested in that you'd like to know more about, let us know. We can find someone who um, can teach that for you. We also have some seed grant money associated with some of these workshops. So this workshop that I'm doing today and then another workshop called Active Hope are both associated with this seed grant program. So because you're offering this workshop today, you're eligible to apply for um, up to $500 in seed grant money um, to go towards any eco project of your choice. So if you have a project that you really wanna work on, if you, for example, congregations have used this to start a community garden, to put some compost or recycling bins around campus. So um, if there's a project that you want to work on and you just need a little bit of funding, you can apply for what's called the Four Directions Fund and apply for some seed grant funding. It's another way that we help to support congregations and support some of their efforts. Um, and then we have a, a bunch of um, practical climate solution programs. So these programs are focused on helping faith communities assess um, their buildings, their facilities, um, and their current practices and thinking about ways to reduce carbon impact on site. So one of our programs is our energy efficiency program. Um, and so we work with a professional engineer who offers low cost energy audits to faith communities. So he'll come in, do a full assessment of your facility and make recommendations for ways that you can reduce um, energy on site by things like switching to LEDs, um, some Wi-Fi thermostats, um, implementing attic insulation. Those are just a couple of things that come up a lot in these audit reports, but he will create a customized audit report based on his findings after doing a walkthrough of your facilities. And then um, we have a matching grant program associated with this. So you can apply for up to $7,000 in matching grant funds every year for up to five years to help implement some of those projects. I looked last night and I think the last time that you all received an energy audit was in 2011. Um, so if you are interested in um, doing a reassessment, this would be a great time to do that. We usually say anywhere between you know, five and eight years, things have changed enough that it's a good idea to do a new assessment and to see where things are at right now. This could be some good low hanging fruit, a good next step for the congregation to do another energy audit and um, kind of see what the engineer recommends as far as some energy efficiency um, practices and uh, new things that you all can implement here on site. We also have a solar program. So we offer free um, solar assessments to congregations. So we work with a number of solar installers um, who we have vetted and who have um, helped put solar on other faith communities. 
Um, so basically, if you're interested in this program, how it works is you let us know that you're interested in solar assessment. Um, we uh, partner with an organization called GreenLink Analytics who will provide a free basic solar assessment. So basically, they'll, um, you know, we'll get your bills, they'll do some analysis, look at your roofs and shading, and just see if solar is even a viable option. Um, then we take that assessment, we send it to our installers, and they'll put together a couple of proposals. All of this is free. Then you have the information where you'll see what, a, what size system might be possible here, what the cost of that might be, and then we can talk to you about a couple of different financing options for solar. There are two main ways um, for fake communities to get solar in Georgia. The first is an outright purchase um, proposal, so you would buy the system outright. You would not be able to take advantage um, of the tax credit as a nonprofit, um, but the system would be yours. You would own it, maintain it, operate it, um, and then recoup any of the, uh, you would be able to recoup the cost of um, the, the system by all of the um, energy that you're saving through the system. The second way of purchasing solar is what's called a solar energy procurement agreement. It's basically a power purchase proposal. So a third party entity would buy the system and sell the power back to you at a discounted rate. So at a lower rate than what you're paying your utility. So they would own, maintain, operate the system. There's no upfront cost to you um, through this method. Um, and then at CEPAs are typically 20 years at the end of 20 years. And they would either sell the system to you at a much lower rate or you could sign another SEPA agreement with them. This is a popular option that a lot of um, congregations take advantage of because again, no upfront cost to you. This third party owns it. They take advantage of the tax credit. That's how they're able to sell the um, energy back to you at a lower rate than your utility. So it's a, you don't see as much of a, um, it's a longer payback period, but there's no upfront cost to the congregation. So anyway, that's a little bit of the details about financing, but I just wanted to share that to give you a little bit of a sense of um, how solar could work for your congregation. So if you're interested in looking into that, again, it's um, completely free to get the assessments and the proposals, and then you would have the information to be able to consider this. A third program that we launched this year is our Zero Waste Program, and so we provide waste assessments to congregations um, to help you think about your current waste practices and ways that you can um, divert waste into recycling and composting um, and thinking about ways that um, you can reduce waste um, by you know creating sustainability policies writing in policies that say we won't use things like styrofoam at church events um, kind of just identifying some standards and policies around like purchasing around events around meals things like that um, so this is a, a, a new program, um, if you all are interested, I know you, since you're on Emory's campus, are able to take advantage of the great waste system that they have there, so maybe this is not necessarily the right program for you, but um, if you're interested in, even in working on a sustainability policy, um, we can certainly help you with that. We would still be happy to come do a waste assessment, but I know you all are in a little bit of a different situation than a lot of congregations um, because you are able to take advantage of Emory's system. And then the last piece of our work is our environmental justice work. So environmental justice basically, um, it's the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So basically, what this means is that everybody has the right to clean air, clean water, to live in a clean and healthy um, environment, regardless of race, income, um, national origin. And we know that um, this is not always the case, that it's often the communities um, that contribute the least to the climate crisis that are the ones who are most impacted by what's happening. Low-income communities, people of color, the elderly, children, and other vulnerable populations disproportionately suffer the economic and health impacts of pollution and environmental issues. And as people of faith, we affirm that justice for creation cannot be achieved without fully addressing the environmental injustices impacting our neighbors and communities. So again, this goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation. If we are to be pursuing justice for all, 
um, as God calls us to do. We must be considering the ways that our climate crisis is impacting communities and people and thinking about ways that we can um, enforce more, uh, enforce policies and advance um, policies at the local, state, and federal level that will protect communities, that will help to clean up our um, water, that will help to reduce air pollution um, so that everybody can um, live in a healthy and safe environment free of pollutants and other environmental injustices. Um, so how do we do that? We do that um, mostly through advocacy, adv um, asking our elected officials to pass policies that will help to protect our communities and our environment. Um, and so we work at the, the local, state, and federal policy level. So um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing right now, but um, in this winter, we were down at the Capitol working um, during the legislative session, meeting with our legislators, asking them to um, advance a couple of policies. One of the things that we work on a lot is coal ash, and I won't dive into this too much today, but basically coal ash is a sludge-like waste that's left over from burning coal for electricity, and it sits in these coal ash ponds adjacent to coal-fired power plants. The coal ash ponds oftentimes um, sit at or below the water table, and they're not lined, and so you've got this sludge-like waste that's called coal ash that contains toxins and it's leaking into the water through, it's just leaking into our, um, into the groundwater and it's getting into domestic wells, it's getting into our drinking water and it's making communities um, very sick. And so one of the issues that we've been working on for a number of years um, in a couple of different ways, but um, primarily through the legislature is um, trying to pass um, some legislation that would require the closure of coal ash ponds and moving all of the coal ash to dry lined landfills where it won't be in contact with the water tables um but we uh you know one of our goals is to equip communities of faith to take action so we can do advocacy workshops where we can do a deep dive into the um issues that we work on we can help to set up um lobby meetings with your Congress people. So if you're interested in lobbying, we can help set up those meetings. We can go to those meetings with you. Um, we do a lot of letter writing campaigns. We do a lot of online petitions and actions. And so um, one of the things that you can do is sign up for our advocacy alert list and you can get emails. Um, you know, advocacy is one of those things that you kind of have to be ready as it happens. We always have new things coming out. And so if you sign up for our advocacy alert list, and you'll get an email with the most current action. A lot of times it's an online form that you can fill out or we'll give you instructions on um, who to write letters to. We'll give you sample text. Um, we, we want to equip you as a congregation to be able to take action. We can do, uh, we have some great documentaries about some of these issues, including coal ash, including our work on the Okefenokee. Um, so we can do a, a um, film screening coupled with a letter writing campaign. Um, so let us know what you all are interested in, how we can, how we can equip your congregation to take action. Um, your voice is incredibly powerful, um, and having your elected officials hear from you, from their constituents, is, um, is a really effective um, measure to help advance some of these issues. The um, issue that I want to talk about today, because it has to do with some of the advocacy that we've been working on this spring, is energy burden. So energy burden is the percentage of gross household income spent on energy costs. Um, An energy burden above 6% is considered unaffordable. And we know that this is not a burden that is shared evenly across society. The national average energy burden for low income households is 8.6, um, which is three times higher than for non-low income households. We know that African-American households experience a median energy burden 64% greater than white households, and Latino households have a median burden 24% higher than white households. And so this um, is an issue that we think about a lot when we think holistically about justice. If you're spending a disproportionate amount of your annual income on energy, then you're making decisions between paying your electric bill and putting food on your table, being able to purchase things like um, clothing, medical things that you need. So it's a, it's a decision that a lot of families are having to make, whether to keep their lights on or to 
um, be able to spend money on other things that they need for their homes and families. Georgia is um, one of the most energy expensive states in the country, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, it's hot here, so we have higher than average temperatures, which means that people are running air conditioning more than in other parts of the country. Um, but also we don't have good state investments um, in energy efficiency programs or in things like solar. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but that's a big issue that we're facing here in Georgia is that um, we pay, so Georgia Power says that we have some of the lowest rates in the country, and while that might be true, we have high mandatory fees on our electric bills. And so that means that we actually don't have a lot of control over how much we're paying on our bills. So even if we have low rates, if we have high mandatory fees, we're losing our ability to control that. So it's not like we can turn our lights off or turn our AC off and expect a low electricity bill if we have these high mandatory fees. We're paying fees for coal ash cleanup. We're paying fees for plant Google, which I'll talk about in a minute. So all of these different mandatory fees that are in our bill on our bills are actually contributing to energy burden in our state and making it more difficult for us to control how much we're paying on our bills. Um, so this all has to do with what's been happening right now with Georgia Power and the Public Service Commission. Um, well, first I'll just mention Plant Vogel and then I'll get into Public Service Commission things. So, if you all are not familiar, Plant Vogel is a nuclear power plant in Burke County. Um, this project has been going on for many, many years. It is um, way behind schedule and way over budget. So, Georgia Power took over the project, I think, in 2017, and they have already collected over $2 billion from customers, most of which is in shareholder profit. Um, so we are paying for the construction of this nuclear power plant, even though we are not receiving any energy from it at this point. Um, this comes up on your electric bills as a nuclear recovery or the nuclear construction cost recovery rider. Um, you'll see it on your bills. Your, the church pays it on their bills. Um, hospitals pay it. Schools pay it. Um, and so this is one of the examples of the mandatory fees that are being um, that are contributing to energy burden that we're all paying on our bills when you, um, you know, thinking about all of the different institutions that pay it. It's not just you. It's, you know, when you're tithing to the church, you're helping to pay the, you, that money's helping to pay for this. So thinking about all of the ways that all, that your funds are going to pay for this project. Um, so some of the solutions are holding Georgia Power accountable to this project, but then also pursuing um, clean energy solutions like solar, pursuing things like energy efficiency programs that will help um, all customers, but especially low income customers and those experiencing energy burden to have um, lower costs on their energy bills. So the solutions are um, energy efficiency. This is the cheapest and um, best solution for energy burden. So being able to lower your bills through things like um, LED bulbs, improving insulation, switching um, conventional windows with high efficiency windows. So all of the ways that you think about um, making your home run more efficiently, um, that's going to lower your energy costs and save, ultimately help save you money. So we need more energy efficiency programs. Georgia Power offers some, but we want to see a big expansion in energy efficiency programs, especially for um, low income and vulnerable communities. The second thing is solar. Um, so again, solar um, creates renewable energy, lowers energy costs, also replaces fossil fuels, improves air quality. Um, so all of this not only helps to lower energy bills, but also improving environmental and public health impacts. We know that solar is expensive. It is not um, necessarily a good solution for everybody. And so one of the things that we want to um, pursue is more friendly solar policies and better solar programs um, to make solar a more accessible option. Um, one of the things that comes into play with solar is called net metering. So net metering basically means that any excess energy that you produce that gets sent back to the grid under a net metering program, any, any, any excess energy that you send back to the grid, you are getting compensated for at the full retail value. Without net metering, any, any, any excess energy that you send back, you're only getting about a third of that. Um, 
And so um, in 2019, during the last integrated resource plan, Georgia Power um, start created a net metering program, but they capped it at 5,000 customers, and that was met almost immediately. So no new customers now who get solar are eligible to be in the net metering program. So this is one of the things that we have been pushing really hard for within this current integrated resource plan procedure with the Public Service Commission, because we want to make sure that solar customers are being fairly compensated for any excess energy they're producing. Um, this makes it, this is important because it makes solar a lot more affordable when you think about actually getting money back for any excess energy that you're producing. We know that during the day, if you're producing a lot of energy, but you're not home to use that energy, that energy is just being sent back to the grid and we want to make sure that you are getting fairly compensated for that. So all of this comes down to our work with the Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission is um, a five member elected body. We like to say it's the most important elected body that nobody knows anything about, um, but you do vote for your public service commissioners and they regulate Georgia Power. So they make decisions about things like um, how much you're paying on your bills. Um, they make decisions about those mandatory fees that I was talking about. They make decisions about how we get our energy. Um, what plants we're operating. They make decisions about coal ash um, and what happens to these coal ash ponds. So these are some really important individuals. And right now, um, from um, March through now, we, there has been what's called an integrated resource plan. So every three years, Georgia Power files this IRP or integrated resource plan with, um, with the Public Service Commission. And this is basically their 30 year forecast for energy use in Georgia. This is um, where they propose to Georgia Power how they will be um, plant, how we will be using energy, how much we'll be re um, investing in renewables, how much they'll be investing in energy efficiency programs. This is where they um, talk about what plants they might be retiring, um, what they plan to do with coal ash. All of these things are part of the integrated resource plan. Then from March through now, we've had a chance to intervene in this proceeding and talk to the Public Service Commission about what we want to see. So this is where we've talked to them about how we want um, more utility solar included in the plan, how we want to bring back net metering, how we want more investments in low to moderate income energy efficiency programs. Um, so we've done a lot of advocacy with them in the last couple of months, really pushing, for, especially for solar and for energy efficiency. Those were the two main things that we were talking to the Public Service Commission about. Um, so hearings just ended the other week. So now um, the Public Service Commission is deliberating and they will make a decision in July about the integrated resource plan. In this time period, we are not able to do any more advocacy with them. However, the second part of this is the rate case. So this is the proceeding that directly follows the IRP, and this is where the Public Service Commission determines how much of the costs Georgia Power can recoup and who will pay those costs. So again, this is the place where we try to prevent Georgia Power from covering their expenses through rate payers. So this is where we will intervene on things like um, the Plant Vogel mandatory fee, the coal ash fees. So if you're interested in getting involved in um, the Public Service Commission and in this advocacy, um, we will have lots of actions around the rate case in the next couple of months. Like I said, there's nothing that we can do right now with the integrated resource plan. They'll make a decision in a couple of weeks and then we'll really gear up for some advocacy around the rate case. And so this is a good time to get on our action alert list. Um, to, uh, we'll have some workshops kind of diving deeper into what the right case is and um, you know what are the specific asks will be around that, but this is a good time to kind of prepare and get ready and then in the fall we'll have some adv advocacy and action around the right case. Um, and then lastly, we um, are involved with federal policy work as well, and so we have been working to help pass um, meaningful climate legislation at the federal level. Um, we know that we need funds for electric vehicles, solar, and many more climate solutions. And so we are asking the Senate to pass um, the $555 billion in historic investments that will deliver on climate, justice, jobs, and clean energy. Um, 
This will help to um, protect our health, the economy, and the environment. And so we would love for everybody now um, to help to tell the Senate that we, um, that we want to pass these climate investments. Um, so this QR code will take you to a petition. All you have to do is um, enter your name and sign the petition, but this is um, a really critical time um, to be able to pass these investments. Um, funding for things like electric vehicles um, that would just expand access to electric vehicles. Again, this is one of the, the solutions that's um, expensive. It's not accessible to a lot of people. We'd love to see a lot more um, electric vehicle infrastructure all over our country. We would love to see um, more investments in things like renewable energy and solar. And we'd love to see funding for um, Justice 40 initiatives specifically for environmental justice work. So if everybody can take out their phones, this is the interactive part of today's presentations. If, if this is something you support and you want to um, take action on this, um, you should be able to take out your phones and scan the QR code um, and sign the petition today. I can also send it out to somebody um, who can distribute it in an email later, but we would love for you all to um, take part in this today. So I'll just leave this up here for right now for a minute. Did everybody get the QR code who wants it? It didn't pick it up? Is, any, is anybody else having trouble? You got it. You might, yeah. Might have to move closer. So, yeah, so this is what's, um, it's not called Build Back Better anymore, but it's a uh, reconciliation package, but it's essentially funding for the same thing. Yeah. So, I have a demonstration. Okay. Um, yeah, so then you click on. Oh. Okay. So, I'm already, already snapped on it, but I did the. Uh, oh, yeah, so just, yep, yeah, so that's the petition, so you should be able to go ahead and sign it now. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and I can put this back up at the end, but actually I think this is the end of my presentation, so that's all I have, and I wanted to make sure I left plenty of time for um, questions. So I'll just leave this screen back up in case you all need to access the QR code still. Yeah, um, so that's something that we are starting to get into a little bit is some work on plastics. There's a plastic um, plant in Macon that we are gonna start to do some advocacy around. Um, I'm not as familiar, it's a new project that our policy associate is just sort of looking into, but we do plan to get involved with some plastics work um, at the state level. That's a great question and a, a concern, and I think that there's still a lot more research that needs to be done about lithium batteries. So I think you know one of I know one of the things that people who are doing this work on electric vehicles that's one of the things that they're looking into is how do we dispose of these safely. Um, so I definitely I hear that concern a lot. I definitely hear that, and I think that's something to that we'll need to continue to look into and stay on top of. Um, I think what I'll say is that we know that um, what we're what we have right now isn't good for the environment. We know that running um, cars on fossil fuels is contributing to air pollution. And so we know that there needs to be another solution. I think that 
with any solution, there are definitely um, benefits and there are cons. And so I would say that that's something that I think we need to continue to do some research on and see. And I think that that, um, yeah, that the best I can say right now is we know what that what we currently have is harming the environment. And so I think continuing to look at solutions um, that or that might be better is a is a good direction to go in, but we need to be able to like keep our eyes open to the some of the drawbacks of those solutions as well. And one of the places that I might point you is Drawdown Georgia. So if you all are not familiar, Drawdown Georgia um, is a project started by some researchers at um, a couple of universities across the state, and they have identified 20 high impact climate solutions to help Georgia reduce our carbon impact in our state. So their goal is to help us reduce carbon emissions by one third by 2030. So they've identified these 20 high impact climate solutions to help us do that. And expanding on electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure is one of those solutions. And what I like about their work is they have looked at um, what they're calling beyond carbon impacts of each of these solutions. So looking at how is the solution positively and negatively going to impact our communities. And so I think um, they might have some information on their website about that. I think the batteries are one of the concerns that they have pointed to of saying, you know, we think this is a good solution as far as reducing our carbon impact and improving air pollution and things like that. However, we know that there's still more research to be done. Um, and so that might be a, a good place for you to look to try to find some more information. Yeah, so we, um, yeah, we do a couple of things with water related issues. So we sit on the Georgia Water um, Coalition's legislative team. Um, and so a couple of the things, so coal ash is one of the major water related issues that we've been working on. Um, we, yeah, I would say that's probably the biggest water related issue that we work on. Um, but we uh, are in partnership with a lot of river keepers across the state that are doing some incredible work and sometimes we'll like partner on projects with them, things like that. We just started a new um, partnership with Chattahoochee River Keeper. So we do um, water cleanups. Actually, the youth from Glen last year um, partnered with us for a local uh, watershed cleanup. Um, so we do offer river cleanups um, we do it on our own and we do it in partnership with Chattahoochee River Keeper. Um, Chattahoochee River Keeper also has a floating classroom on West Point Lake in LaGrange. And so we do some floating classroom outings with them where we do some demonstrations of um, water testing and talk about water issues. So it's a little bit of a drive for you all, but if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the Chattahoochee watershed and water testing, water quality issues in our state, um, that might be a good program for you all. Yeah, um, I mean, I know that there are lots of folks who have done letter writing campaigns to the big um, stores like Publix and Walmart. Um, so I would say that's one thing that you all can do is to write letters. I think um, what would be great is if there were some state legislation um, that would ban plastic bags, other states have done this. And so that might be something that we could help you all work on if you all have a lot of interest in um, trying to do some advocacy at the state level for plastic bans. Um, I think, you know, a lot of those places will do, will have recycling, like will recycle the plastic bags. And so I know that ideally we would like them to not even have recycling bags, but you could do, you know, some kind of information or programming collection of plastic grocery bags and drop offs to those locations. to so at least be able to recycle the bags could be one thing that you all could do um, kind of at a smaller level, but I would say, yeah, if you're interested in like the advocacy piece, writing letters to the corporations, um, 
And then also we could talk about either um, local or statewide ordinances or bans. Like I know the city of Clarkson recently passed a, um, a resolution or an ordinance banning plastic bags in public places. So it could be, you know, it could be interesting to think about how to do that in Decatur or, um, you know, in this area. So we can talk, we could talk more about that. I would need to look into, uh, talk to our policy associate about what the options could be for some of those advocacy pieces, but that could be something that we, that we look into. Yeah, that's something I have to look more into, but um, yeah, I can definitely talk to our policy associate and try to get some more information on that and circle back. Because I think if there's already, there's already some support from some of our legislators on this, and I think, um, yeah, figuring out how to kind of ramp up those efforts and support that and garner more interest around that could be a really good, and I know other green teams, this comes up a lot, we, so we have, um, 96 green teams across the state and we have monthly green team roundtables, which is a chance for green teams to just come together and talk about issues they care about. But this issue of plastics and wanting to do advocacy around plastics comes up a lot in our green team meetings. And so I do think that there would be interest and support from other faith communities that we work with on this issue. Well, thank you all so much for your time this morning. Um, I'm around. Um, my email is hannah at gipple.org, so please let me know if you have any follow-up questions or want to um, get involved in our work. Thank you.